academic. So anyways, this is, this is his most recent paper. And there's no real importance to looking at any of these individual articles. It's just sort of to give you an idea of what a, a very serious academic does in this field. And um, you can even give him a call. There's his phone number. So call him up and talk to him. Now, FIU has some very serious researchers as well. Um, Probably the most famous is Alan Weiss, or one of the most famous, so let's see. He wrote a book on data structures and algorithms. <clears throat> right? And you can see many of you will be going on to FIU but he's gotten many, well, his, his selected publications are way less than Sartaj Sani. I wonder if, let's see if we can find his full CV, just out of curiosity. Let's see here. Oh, here, here it is. Oh yeah, he has a 10 page CV. That's, that's pretty long. Okay, anyways, we, we won't have to sit here and look at um, all of these things, but just wanted to sort of give you an idea of what academic computer scientists do and sort of articles they write and just maybe just look at a few of them. Um, there you go. Okay. Yeah, this is just the research side of things. Um, a lot of times they have to apply for a grant. Yeah, exactly. PhD level stuff. They're, they're, they're all PhDs and they, they probably request a grant from the NSF, National Science Foundation, um, or the grant could come from any number of places. It could come from a corporate environment. It could come from a lot of different places. But with grant money, they run their labs, and they have um, time to write things up, and they, if they need equipment, then they buy the equipment with the grant money. Oh, here's another interesting thing about where I went to school. They're recently getting a really big computer. And it's kind of cool. Let's see. Here it is. UF announces $70 million artificial intelligence partnership with NVIDIA. Okay, so this is what the supercomputer is going to look like, which to me is pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, it just, just looks cool. And I'll just post a larger image of it here. Oh, that's interesting. So that image is too big to post in Discord. Okay, so let's see. There's a $50 million gift from this UF alumnus. And NVIDIA, the company, is going to be matching it. And they're calling their new supercomputer Hypergator. So a computer this big and powerful is not going to be one that you're running a you know small application from <laughs> you're not you're not hosting your 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 chemistry app that you just worked on there that this is for very large research and um, you know it doesn't have to be academic research on such a computer but it's pretty it's pretty neat and um, if you're interested in artificial intelli 
intelligence, it seems like here in the state of Florida, there are some big things happening because once, once you're talking about $50 million plus 20 more million, 70 million can get you a lot in artificial intelligence research. So it's kind of an interesting thing to just point out. Okay, let's see. Let's move on now to, oh, someone got the image, but, but smaller, I guess. That's nice. That's pretty cool. So the NVIDIA co-founder went to UF and I mean, I, I certainly felt like I had some, some colleagues and, and classmates who were really very talented there. So he went, oh, he was, he was before my time. He's, he's a bit older than me, but anyways, he, uh, wow, that's, that's quite a, it's quite a resume because they've really made some huge advancements. Really quite a, quite a company. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and close that down and we'll close this down. And now we'll take a look at some C++ code. So go ahead and click on this link and I keep hearing some background. So somebody has their mic open. Let's see who it is. Uh, let's see. Okay, perfect. Not that it's a huge deal for me to hear myself, but mostly I hear the beeps from Discord. Okay, so let's take a look at this, what I have so far. So what we're going to do is we're going to just take it for a few lines at a time. So here we have three lines at the top. So we see include IO stream, include F stream, include vector. So what is the first include for? What does that do? Okay, input output stream, good. C out and C in, very good. And now how about the next line? Good. Reading in files. And so we can read and write with files. Good. And then the last one, what is a vector? So good. We have some different Because it's good to see different points of view. What is a vector? Okay, so Jose says a dynamic array. That's that's good. And well, Sergio, you're right. Uh, aren't vectors like arrays? They're they're similar, very similar to arrays because you have sequential data, one thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And then Daniel writes an array that you can keep on adding indexes onto. Yeah, that makes sense because you're not limited by the size. So it is dynamic. You can keep adding indexes on it. So that's all good. All good definitions. And now we see the int main. So I start with a line, a name of a file, and a vector. So this is just definitions, just defining variables. Okay. And this, this is all pretty much straightforward code that you can find in any number of tutorials. And the next is if you can open this file, 
which we're using names.txt. Do me a favor, go ahead and click on names.txt and just describe in a sentence what's in the file. Mostly just to show you, you can click on you can click on different files inside Replit, even though usually up to this point, we've been working with just main.cpp, but you can have many different data files and other code in your REPL. So yeah, it's a list of names, and I just I also wanted you to look at them because they're they're randomly generated. So I went to a website and I said, "Give me 50 random names," and then I just typed that you know one more to just make it like an odd number. So I just had 51. So I thought I thought some of them were kind of unique names, like well, I mean they're randomly generated, so they're just. I don't exactly know how they randomly generated them. Maybe they have like a million names in the database, then they combine different first names and last names, but whatever, it's not, it's not super important. Just the point is that I didn't sit there and type all these out because this is just data to prototype some behavior. Right. In this case, we are reading the data into a vector. And then what we want to do coming up is we want to search if a user's name is inside the data. So instead of just um, reading the, the file each time, we'll read the file into a vector and then work with the vector. Okay, so then I just print out how many names were added just to show that it did work and we're able to, we're able to see 51 and that's what we see when we run it on the right. So nothing super surprising right now. But what we're going to do is we're going to ask the user for a name to search for. And I, I like what a student did in um, my Monday, Wednesday for the first name. So go ahead and do that. Ask for just the first name. And go ahead and, and write this out. And then after a minute or so, paste right here, paste your approach here. And then actually read in the value, read in the first name and store it in a variable.
Okay, let's see. Does anyone have these two lines? Okay, got a link here, good. Okay, very good. So he's got he's got three lines. That works too. And then we've got what is the first name? Then we make a variable first name and then we read in the first name. Yeah, that perfect. Really nice. Excellent. So now what we have to do is we have to go through the list of names, the vector of names and we have to see, is the first name inside those names? So how do we loop through those names? Well, let's go ahead and make a for loop. We can say for string, and we could just put n within names. This is the enhanced for loop. It's often called the for each, for each. And now we can check to see, is the current name the same as the first name? Or no, that's not the best way to put it. We can say, is the first name inside this name in the list? All right, that's a little better. So let's go to C++ string. Click on this reference. You see I was visiting this yesterday. And let's see if we can find a function that's inside of here that will help us with this question. Let's look, what about this? You know, I, I have to say there's something funny about advertising online. Um, Sometimes I think, oh, the advertisers know everything about us. They're, they're, they're so smart with how they know everything. But then look at the ad on the top of my screen here. I mean, I, I can make out a little bit of this important information by now. Well, I guess I can read it. So the advertisers knew that I knew enough Spanish to read that ad. But Spanish isn't my go-to language, and yet... I mean, it's just because I'm in Miami that they, they give me the ads in Spanish. But um, sometimes I get ads for things that I would never buy in a million years. Like, just the, the weirdest things. Like, it, 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 they, I've seen ads where, like, Alzheimer's medication. I think Alzheimer's. Are my, search, are my searches indicating that I have Alzheimer's? This is crazy. But I don't know. Sometimes ads are really totally a failure, bad algorithm. And sometimes... It can be things that I want. So maybe it's just totally random. It just seems like a waste of money for them to be randomly throwing out all these ads. But I don't know. I mean, we're still pretty early on in this experiment of, of targeted advertising and everything. Targeted, targeted ads. Recently, ads have been crazy. You mean like, um, how so? Oh, too many, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I do think about ads a lot because they fund the internet. But one thing that I started doing was I started paying for YouTube. Yeah, I used to do that. I started paying for YouTube premium. So it's only 10 bucks a month. But there's no ads on on YouTube. Um, I mean, if I was a student, I'd probably just keep using Adblocker as well. 
But I, I do think about like the creators. Creators should get some payment. Oh, you use a VPN too? Wow, you're you're really securing your your traffic. It's worth it. Let's see. I've yes, 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 yes. I I I do agree. Um another thing they do is they put like just ridiculous things like um medical disgusting medical images and yeah. No, no, no. The YouTubers do get money from ads. YouTubers do get paid from ads. So that that's where that's where I you know, was saying I like to pay for the YouTube premium. I mean, if it was a hundred bucks a month, I wouldn't pay for it. It would just be too much. But ten bucks a month, I say, well, yeah, that's that's reasonable. But anyways, okay, so now here we are in Find, and we can see on Find that they give some, they give some code samples, and basically, if you read through this, you'll see if you don't find anything, you get negative one, okay? So this... This is the code here from this link. Let's see, Matthew says, I open certain YouTubers videos in incognito mo window to temporarily, temporarily disable ad block to support said, you well, that's, that's a good solution. That's, that makes sense. So here we see string str dot find str2. And this is going to return whether or not you can find one string in the other. Can string2 be found in str? So what we can do is we can go back to here and say if n which is going to be the current line in the file, dot find. And now we're going to compare it with what the user entered in. So the user entered in first name. If it doesn't equal to negative one, that means you found it. And we can print out name found in records. Okay. So let's run it. And let's just try um, David. Okay. No David in there. So somebody who's opened up the file, give me someone's first name in the file to see if we can find the name in the record. Okay. Let's try Jorge. So we run this again. What is the first name? Good. Name found in records. So this works. This works. Now, this is your mission. Because you know I like to give programming questions where I give you a framework, but then you continue it. So what you need to do is print out if the name is not found in the record. Okay, so let's take a few minutes. Um, I don't know. We'll give. We'll give like. Um, how about this? Send me a private message with your solution when finished. That's the best way of timing it. So when you're when you're confident you can do this, just send me a DM 
with your replit link.
Okay, so let's all come back together. And I, I got a lot of messages from students. So lots of people, lots of students are attempting this. And some are getting it perfect, but most, the most common thing is that that's incorrect is people are just checking the first word in the file. And they're saying, okay, is the name that the person typed in the same as the first word in the file? If it is, say, name found in records. If it's not, name not found in records. And you really need to check all. You need to check all the items in the list. So some people did get it working. Um, and I think people would be able to get it working if they had more time. But you know how it is with these examples. We just have to spend a certain amount of time on them and then see a correct answer and then move on. So, but Frederick, can you show us that correct answer and link us oh, to yeah. it? For, for sure, yes. That's, that's a, a great, great request. So let's see. Um, isn't the search kind of wrong because we were asking the user for first name, but also checking last names? Uh, yes, that's a good point. We could restrict. Actually, that, that wouldn't be hard to fix. We could split the names into first and last names and then only check the first name. So that's that's a, a that's a good approach, right? So if we look here on our our list of string operations, we can see that we have probably something in here that can help us with that. Mm, but we can probably just use substring. Substring might work. We don't even need to split it. We could just use substring. Professor, what is a substring? Substring is part of a string. So, like if you have a string a, B, C, D, if you just want the first part of it, you can use the substring and you can get just A, B. So A, B is a substring of A, B, C, D. So look at this example they have here on this site. Actually, um, you know what we could do? I think I, think I know a good uh, idea without even maybe using substring. So look, look at this example first. It says string str equals we think in generalities, but we live in details. And then we see if you get between, if you get three five moving on, then you get think. So in our case, what we're looking for is we're looking for str.substring. We need to start at zero, and we need to continue for the length of the name that the user entered in. OK, so we can use this. We can use this to only check the first name. So Daniel's bringing up a good point because we're, we're asking for a first name, but it could be their last name. And then our code won't even, won't even care, right? So let's go through here. And instead of just using find, we can say if n dot substring from zero through the length. So that's first name, 
dot length. Okay, if that equals first name, then first we can say first name found in records. And the way to make this really work, what I was looking for was some sort of bool switch. So we can say bool found first name equals false. And then if we do find the first name in records, we could say found first name equals true. And we can even break out of this loop. And then at the end, we can say if found first name, if not found first name, then we say na first name not in records. And then even instead of just doing first name not in records, we could just put the we could just put the first name. That'll look better. First name, not in records. Okay, so um, is it possible there's an error in here? Of course, totally possible. But that's why we do testing. So when I type out these examples, I'm I'm not reading from a script, right? Like I'm just I'm just testing it out. So let's let's go ahead and see. Okay, what is the first name, Jorge? First name found in the records. Now let's pick a name that's not in there. So David, David not in the records. So it looks like it's working. Now let's try it with a last name. Let's try Groom. Let's try Groom. So we run it again, and we say, what is the first name, Groom? Groom not in the records, because there is no Groom with the first name. It's, Should we make a variable for the last name as well, then? Um, you could if you wanted to ask the user for the last name. You could ask the user for the last name, and then you would just have to adjust your substring to match that. But wouldn't that make sense for this program? Well, it could. I mean, all this whole program is just just made up. You know, like I'm saying, let's let's take a fake list of names and read it into a vector. And then we'll ask the user for a fake name, and then the user types it in, and then we check to see if the name is inside the records. So we could really adjust this to any number of different things. Like this example could take lots of different twists and turns. So if we did want to search for last name, we could totally search for last name. If we wanted to add in other info, we could add in other info. So we're only really limited by time. And well, the complexity of it, we don't want to make it too complex, but asking for something like, what is the last thing? That's, that's a good question. That's a valid thing. I do want to move on to searching and sorting. So I don't, I don't think we'll do that today, but that might be a fun that thing. That could be a good one for another day, in other words. Yeah, it could be a good one for another day. It could be a fun thing for you as a class to try. Right, so ask for the last name and search the file, search the names for it. Okay, any last comments about this exercise? Questions, thoughts? Let's see, I got a message. Okay. Okay, great. So. Let's go ahead and move on to searching and sorting. Is searching and sorting a hard thing to do? Um, it can be, it really can be. It, not the, the examples we're going to look at are not very hard, but the, it, can be, it can be a very, very complicated topic. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, sir. Good, good. Nice. The, um, 
The thing is that the examples we're going to look at are not terribly difficult. So today's are not too difficult. I mean, I was just asking because I have never done this before. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's it it can be a really in depth, like it can be a super super huge topic. I mean, if I was to just look for merge sort C++, and I go here, the code to do the merge sort is so long that I can't copy and paste it into, let me see, let me try. Because yesterday I thought it was a, not able to work, but let's see. So I'm going to copy and paste. Yep, it's it's too big. So I I can't even fit I cannot fit merge sort. Merge. Yeah, that's very confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this code is very confusing. <laughs> I can't fit merge sort into the code on Discord without making it a file. So so we can just look here for a second. And we can see they have a merging component. They have uh, merge sort. Then they have void. to make a utility function. They have a void thing. Yeah, this this is a big endeavor, right? You you don't just sit down and in two seconds come up with this. Maybe if I just focus on merge and merge sort, it will work. Let's see. You without this utility function. All right, let's see. Let's try this. Yeah, this works. Okay, so this is complicated code, right? I mean, it it's it's a big deal, right? It's not just two seconds and you you type it out. And if you continue on in computer science, you're going to take a course called data structures and algorithms where you you focus on this and and there's a reason why that's known as a really really hard course it's known as a hard course because it's not super easy to just type it out it takes a lot of study a lot of reading a lot of research a lot of thinking about it and people do it all the time people write merge sort but there's a lot of moving pieces in that code and and it it's it's just to answer the question is searching and sorting easy or hard well i think that the textbook for this introductory class does a good job of focusing on pretty easy algorithms so i think the ones that we're going to look at are easy but there's a trade off easy algorithms are generally slow so if we take the algorithms that we have at, that we're going to look at today and we go try to apply them to problems with a lot of data, you're going to find that they run very slowly. And that's why you need the more complex algorithms. So there's that trade-off between how long it takes people to understand it and to write it and you know how fast it works. Now, most programmers don't write their own searching and sorting algorithms. Most developers use algos written by others. But it still makes sense to look behind the curtain to see how, what's the process for doing something like this? How do we analyze these algorithms? Uh, we don't just want to say, leave it to someone else, leave it to someone else, because Someone does need to work on this topic, and maybe someone in here at some point will need to tweak a search algorithm or a sorting algorithm. And that's why we learn this, right? So I, I just don't think it's a good idea to say, oh, skip this chapter. We don't need to know about this. It, it's important to, to look at these algorithms, especially the ones that the book starts with. You will be able to follow them. So... That's just like a, a little pep talk before we start looking at the code. And, and also, 
yeah, I mean, you, you should you should understand it. The, the whole point isn't to just be blindly copying and pasting. Now, most of the time, people aren't copying and pasting if they're using searching and sorting algorithms. A lot of programming languages have sort built in. So if we were to look up C++ vector sort. That's cool. It is. It is cool. And this is sort of, this is sort of the, the thing I was talking about. Like, you can be a developer and, and not know what's going on under the hood, like, and it still will sort for you. Like, look at this example. We can just say sort, sort this vector. And this is the syntax, right? We didn't, we didn't worry at all with this code about how sort is implemented. How is sort implemented? We don't know. But yet, I still contend that it, it's important to have an idea for how sorting algorithms are written. Well, find, find is a search algorithm. We were just looking at find a few minutes ago, and we didn't know how it was implemented. But I bet we could look it up really quickly. Let's look it up. Source code, source code for C++ sort um vector probably i should add stl in there ah this is what i want yes this is good so geeks for geeks is a pretty good site the feeling geeks for geeks would come up so it says here okay this is interesting the algorithm used by sort is intro sort intro sort is a Intro sort being a hybrid sorting algorithm using uses three sorting algorithms to minimize the running time. It uses quick sort, heap sort, and insertion sort. Simply putting, it is the best sorting algorithm around. Amazing. I didn't know that it was so in-depth. Okay, so if you did want to know more about the sorting algorithm that C++ uses, they give you... They give you a lot of info on this site, Geeks for Geeks. Anyway. That's very cool. Yeah, it is. It is really cool. I like, I like this site. You can really learn a lot about the internals of languages. All right. So now, now that we looked at some really super complicated algorithms, now we'll take things down a notch and come back to an introductory course and see what the easiest searching and sorting algorithms are. Okay, so when we're searching, we're looking for an item in a list of information, and we're gonna look at two algorithms today. We'll look at linear search and binary search. So linear search is sequential search. This is where we start at the first element, and we step through all the items in the array looking for the value you're searching for. So you go sequentially, first position, second position, third position, fourth position, on and on and on. You might go through all the elements in the array, but you will eventually either find it or not find it. So let's say we have a list of numbers. I, I just use list and array as synonyms, right? They're, it's the same thing. So here we have num list 17, 23, 5, 11, 2, 29, and 3. So if you're searching for 11, you have to go through 17, 23, 5, and then 11. Now let's say you're searching for the number 7. You have to go through all of them, and you can't find it because there is no 7 in there. So what's the algorithm? Well... We set found to false, set position to negative one, set index to zero. While index is less than the number of elements and found is false. So we leave when it's true. If the current index inside the list is equal to the search value, we set found to true, we set position to index. 
Otherwise, we just keep adding one to index, adding one to index. When we get to the end of the list, we're done, or when we find it, we're done. And then we return the position. So this is a pretty straightforward algorithm. It doesn't take very long to explain. Just look through all the elements in the list. And this is the code for it. We've got search list that takes in a list of numbers, the number of elements, and the value you're looking for. Now, compare this with merge sort. This is much shorter. And much easier. And much easier. So, so this, what I'd recommend you to do is try typing this into disk, into Replit. I almost said Discord. Into Replit. And then make up an array oh. of ints and a search value. See if you can get this to run. Now, we won't do this right now because people type at different speeds. Some people type really slowly. Some people type fast. But just typing this out will be beneficial. Thank you for, for, for not making us do it right away. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, we're already at 1123, so we want to try to finish all these slides. But I really do like that. I know I mention it a lot. Just typing code into a REPL. Good practice. Yes, it's good practice because you're thinking about syntax. You're, you're really spending your time looking at the indentation, seeing, seeing it run on your, your REPL. It's not a waste of time. It, it can be beneficial to your progress. So don't forget about that as just another way that you can study this, this topic. Okay, so the benefits are, this is a pretty easy algorithm to understand. The array can be in any order. But what are the disadvantages? It's slow, inefficient. You know, if you try to use this linear search algorithm on really big, big, big data, millions of records, your computer is just going to sit there and hang. It's going to be very, very slow. Let's see. For the decoder assignment, can you use arrays? So you can uh, you can solve the decoder assignment in any number of different ways. I think that's why it's a cool assignment. There's currently an assignment on, on Memer, which is not written by me. I write most of these assignments, but this one, I looked into their, their, their little library. So let me show you what I'm talking about. If you go to Memer, and you go to content library, you can see that there's memer content that they have lots of pre-written assignments. They have pre-written assignments about data structures. You know, we're starting to talk about algorithms, data structures come next usually. Um, they have data science examples. They have assembly. They have assignments written for students learning assembly. And then under intro to programming, they have some really cool ones. They have Games with Battleship. Oh, could somebody mute? Somebody left themselves unmuted. All right. So I really want to start using some of these, not just because I don't like to write the assignments. I have a lot of assignments written from previous semesters. I don't mind writing them. But these are new, and they're, they're really good. They, they spent a lot of time making these. They've got the paint bot, and the paint bot does all sorts of it's like, it's like you're programming a robot. They put really a lot of effort into doing these on, on Memer. So I'm, I'm really a big fan. I think they're getting a lot more content like this because HackerRank purchased them. And HackerRank, really, their expertise is on writing good questions, checking the answers. Um, makes a lot of sense that these two companies are now one. So I think they're just going to keep making Memer more and more um, well, better. I mean, that more better. <laughs> yeah, it's great practice for learning, and and I really like it. So this is the first one that I posted. 
and it's called Codebreaker. So I did it last night, and I see two students have already gotten full full credit. Um, they're going to get the – here, let's just look at Joshua. He um, – um, he, professor, I have a yes. question. You can answer it later, but when is the decoder project due? Um, I think it's due. I can answer that now. It's due on eight two, so August, August second. Okay, that's why. So yeah. yeah, no, no, that's a good. That's a good question. So you you have two tests that run from, it run from like their automatic testing program, okay? So you'll know if you got those 40 points. Then after you get your 40 points, you have to explain how your code works. So let's read what he writes, and then I'll give him a score right in front of you. So he, it says, explain in your own words how your decoding program works. My program takes the input number and checks if the absolute value is within the alphabetical range, 26 letters. Since zero is disregarded, if the input number is greater than zero, it corresponds with the lowercase alphabet. We can add 96 to the value since the index begins at one. This corresponds to the ASCII codes for the lowercase alphabet. With input less than zero, I take the absolute value and add 64 to correspond with capital letters. Now, this is, he's actually a high school student, and he's really bright, and that's perfect. Like, there's, there's nothing else I could That's add. very impressive. Very impressive. Now, he actually solved it a little differently than me. So I solved this when I first saw the problem. And let's just look at the problem here. So let's go to... Where is the problem? Preview. That's how we see the problem. So mine says submitted, but I can preview it again. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so here it is. Each number represents the corresponding letter of the English alphabet. 1 equals A, 2 equals B, 3 equals C, 26 equals Z. Negative numbers represent uppercase numbers. Negative 1 equals A, negative 17 equals Q. All other numbers are ignored. A non-numeric code indicates the end of each secret message. Now, when I did this for the first time, I was getting three out of the four that passed. Three out of the four passed. So when I first wrote it, I got three out of four. I had 30 out of 40 points. So if, if I got the... You know, if that was a, a test and I got 10 points for the other thing, that would be like around the B range, maybe a C, because I probably wouldn't get full credit because something is wrong. So it does require you to sit and think about it a little bit. And the thing that got me was plainly written up here. They, they, they had it in the instructions, right? And I just wasn't looking at it carefully. So I fixed it and turned it in. So it's not like it took me a super long time to do it. But what I want to point out is I, I solved it using this. So the student that I just showed you his write-up, he solved it using ASCII code, okay, ASCII values. And that's a great solution. I just used this alphabet up here because that's what they gave me, right? They gave me this alphabet. I said, well, I'll use it because that was given to me. And I think it's a really fun problem. It'll probably take you some time. You're not going to just sit there in two seconds and type it out. You have to think it through and look at the code and see what's going on. But in the end, it's very much doable. And you can get a coded message and then decode it. So it also makes you think about ciphers and, you know, encryption, decryption, like in a really simple manner, but that's how we start when we learn about things. We start with simple examples. So you have a lot of days to do it, and you have a lot of submissions. Like you're not limited by the submissions. That's another thing that I like about this one. Yours was 100 lines. Wow. Okay. But you did solve it, right? And in the end, didn't you learn a bit? I mean, it's... It's going to expand your mind. It's going to help you to 
learn about these different topics. So I'm, I'm really a big fan of these assignments. Um, let's see, you knew the answers from the start. You wish you could have done it shorter. Yeah, I think that's that's a draw when people are programming. They try to make things shorter. Write more elegant code. Yes, exactly. Numbers into letters. Which topic would this be related to so we can refer to it? Um, if statements, characters, um, strings, because they do want you to return a string. So you have to just add the character to the string, um, but you know, a string is just an array of characters. So yeah, those are the basics. You can do it with just those things, if statements, characters, strings. Just the most challenging thing is just thinking about the logic behind it. But it's it, there's really nothing like new syntax, you know what I mean? Like there's no, There's nothing that you need to use that we haven't already used. Like all the stuff here that we haven't we haven't done, they gave to you. Like here you see CN fail. Like that's something we haven't covered, but they gave that to you in the starter code. Right? So everything that you can use to solve this is stuff that we've covered up to this point. So they they give you they give you the things that might look, I didn't add that, that's my point. I didn't add that. Oh, unlimited, unlimited. You could, you could have a thousand. I, um, I think there's benefits to having limited submissions and there's benefits to having unlimited su submissions. So benefits to limited, benefits to unlimited. The benefits to limited solutions is yeah, Edison, just keep trying stuff. Limited solutions really forces your attention. And what I try to do is on assignments that are really straightforward, like printing your name or something like that, then you got to have limited solutions because it's a pretty straightforward assignment. Now, this one, you have to be clever with your logic and you have to think it through. And, you know, it, it requires more thought. This, this requires thought. You, you will have to use your your brain to solve this one. It, it's not just, you know, two seconds. You're going to have to think, okay, how do I do this? How do I set it up? So in that case, the unlimited solutions, unlimited solutions encourage uh, persistence. So you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying, and then eventually you'll be able to get it. So I'm sure you'll be able to get it but it's just going to take a bit of time sitting there and, you know, just doing it. Okay. So that's, that's about this latest assignment, but it's, it's not super related to chapter eight. Chapter eight is not needed to do this assignment. So the way this class works is not like whatever topic we, we discuss in the PowerPoint, like the assignment corresponds to it. So it's definitely something that you can do without linear search or anything like that. It's nothing, nothing to do with that. Yeah. And, and it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's just, it's just about thinking through the, the inputs and making sure that you deal with ignoring other numbers. Um, you're able to work with, oh, I guess negative and positive numbers. So he used the absolute value function. I ended up just um, saying, okay, if it's negative, multiply by a negative one. 
but all right. I think I think people see the way this is set up, and I think we're ready to go back to presentation. Okay. So now we're on to binary search. Binary search requires that the array elements are in order. Okay. The array elements have to be in order. So what happens? You divide the array into three sections. You've got the middle element. You've got elements on one side of the middle element, so the smaller. Then you've got elements on the other side of the middle, middle element, the larger. If the middle element is the correct value, you're done. Otherwise, go to step one using only the half of the array that may contain the correct value. So you either have the smaller values or the larger values. And you continue steps one and two until either the value is found or there are no more elements to examine. So here we have numlist two. And we're searching for the value 11. Guess what? 11 is in the middle. You find 11 and you stop. Now we're searching for value 7. And we look in the middle at 11. We say, no, it's not an 11. 7 is smaller. We now check 3. No, it's not 3. We check 5. We stop. There's no more. So what is the pseudocode? You set the first index to zero. Set the last index to the last subscript in the array. Set found to false. Set position to negative one. While found is not true and first is less than or equal to last, set the middle to the subscript halfway between first and last. If middle is the right value, you set found to true, set position to middle. Now here's the trick to binary search. If your middle element is greater than the desired value, you set the last to be middle minus one. Otherwise, you set the first to be middle plus one. So you're doing divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. So this is the code for the binary search function. Now, it's getting a little more complicated than the previous search function. We see we have first, last, middle, position equals negative one, just like with our fine um, function before from C++. Bool found equals false. While you haven't found it, and the first is less than or equal to the last, find the middle. Middle equals first plus last divided by two. If the array element in the middle is equal to the value, found is true, position is middle. Else if the array at the middle position, right, if the element in the middle, posi middle position of the array is greater than the value, we say the last is equal to middle minus one. Okay, so the value has to be in the lower half. Otherwise, the value is in the upper half. Again, I recommend type out this code into REPLit. Make a REPL and test this out. But actually type it out. Don't just copy and paste it. Because if we copy and paste it from Geeks for Geeks, yeah, that's okay, but you don't get the, the experience of, of typing it out, which is beneficial. Okay, so what are the benefits? It's much more efficient than linear search. All right, so now we're dealing at a, a logarithmic scale in terms of how many comparisons are made. The disadvantages, it requires that the array elements be sorted. Now we're going to talk about sorting algorithms. So when we sort, we arrange values into an order. We've got alphabetical, ascending numeric, descending numeric. And we're going to look at two algorithms today, bubble sort and selection sort. So bubble sort compares the first two elements. If they're out of order, 
exchange them to put in order. Then we move down one element, compare the second and third elements, exchange if necessary. We continue until the end of the array. Then we pass through the array again, exchanging as necessary. We repeat until the pass was made with no exchanges. So here we have a list of numbers, 17, 23, 5, and 11. And we compare 17 and 23. That's fine. Nothing to sort. So we go on to 23 and 5. And they're not in the correct order, so we swap them. So now we're going to have 17, 5, 23. And then we're going to look at 23 and 11. Well, that's not the correct order, so we've got to exchange. And they show on? What's that? And then we compare 17, 5, and 11 and show on. Exactly. So, yes, yes. You, you're, you're leading into the next slide. Now, on the next slide, we see 17, 5, 11, and 23. So with 17 and 5, we have to exchange them. We have to swap them. So now we have 5, 17, 11, 23. That's not right. 17 and 11 aren't in the right order, so we have to exchange them. So in the end, we have 5, 11, 17, 23. We didn't exchange 17 and 23 because they're in the right order. So this is the structure of a bubble sort. And it will always work you'll always get the data in order. This is the code to do a bubble sort function. So we have an array being sent into sort array and the size of the array. And then we have bool swap and int temp. So while we're swapping, while swap is true, we continue. So we start off set swap to false. We say that's the default. And then we're going to loop through and say, okay, count equals zero, while count is less than size minus one, count plus plus. If the current position is greater than the next position, we've got to swap them. Now, this is the most important part of this question. Why do we need a temp variable? Somebody just think this through. Why do we need a temp variable? Why not just put count, count plus one into count and then vice versa? Think, it, think about it. Temp because we're attempting. Mm, well, temp is going to be short for temporary. Temporary arrangement. Well, it's a, it's a temporary arrangement. While Let's we're see. swapping them to make sure they're in the correct uh, way. Well, we yeah we we have to swap them to make sure they're in the correct they're in the correct order. So we see here Sergio's writing the speed. In case you don't have to switch it, no, it's not. It's not. It's not a way to go back. Like we're we're certain we do need to swap these because. Let's see, temporary to clear the space and swap the value. Now we're getting more towards the right answer. Because if we just go from one position into another, yes, we need to temporarily hold the data. Otherwise, without it, we will have the same value in both elements of the array. OK? So we can, we can test this out. Now, I'm going to go to, to save time, my REPLs. And let's go to the one we had yesterday. Bubble sort C++. OK, so. The nice thing about this example, I got this from Geeks for Geeks, is it uses pointers. Because we're going to start covering pointers soon. So it's, it's important to learn like what the syntax of pointers are. Pointers point to a memory location. Okay, Pointers 
point to a memory location. And this is just what the swap looks like with pointers instead of with a, uh, the array like we were looking at before. So we run it and we see that this will work. We, we can get this data here, 11, 12, 22. It's out of order. This will sort it, no problem. But if I was to get rid of this temporary variable, and I was to just go from YP into XP, and then XP into YP, look what's going to happen. We just keep getting the same element. Same element without... That cannot be correct. Yes, exactly. Same element without the temp variable. So it's just broken. It will not work. You need the temp variable. So we change this back. We change this back. Um, okay, so that's that's not needed for this part. No. That's for that's for the, this part. That's for just CNC out. You see how they don't have the I/O stream, but yet they are able to print in and print out. Let's learn more about this. That's the best idea. Okay, this is a special geeks for geeks thing. It's for from competitive programming. So it's, it's every standard library. So could we use it? Could we rewrite this to not include it? Yeah, we could. But um, I just took this from Geeks for Geeks, so I just left it in exactly as they had it. But if I was to change this and just do IO stream, I'm pretty certain it would work. Yeah, it, it works no problem just changing to IO stream. So the, there's nothing magic in that import that's doing anything with the, um, with the swap. All right, great. So let's continue on. Now, bubble sort. Fairly easy to understand. We're taking two separate... We're taking two consecutive items and swapping them if they're out of order. Okay. But what's the disadvantage? It's slow. Bubble sort is slow. Selection sort. Here's the idea for sorting in ascending order. What you do is you find the smallest element in the array. Then you exchange it with the element in position zero. Then you find the next smallest element in the array. And then you exchange it with the element in position one. And you continue until all the elements are arranged in order. Smallest, next smallest, next smallest, next smallest. Does this concept make sense? Yep. Okay, good. So conceptually, we're all on the same page. We're finding the smallest, putting it in zero. Finding the next smallest, putting it in one. So here we have 11, 2, 29, and 3. So the smallest is 2. Put that to the front. The next smallest is 3. Put that in the front. The next smallest is 11. You put that. And notice when I say front, we're moving on. As we move an element, we go, okay, this this, this, and then once we get to the end, we're done. It's all sorted. This is the code for the selection sort. We send in an array. We send in the size. We've got start scan, min index, min value. So we have two for loops for selection sort. 
selection sort, the true MVP. Uh, technically, yes. it would be a nested for loop. Yes, nested for loop. Nested for loop. Okay, so copy and, well, paste your link here, and then we'll take a look at it. So we had a student who was ambitious and was typing out the code. So now we can take a look at it. And the good news is we're doing pretty good on time. So we're, we're going to finish everything, which is good. Okay. So here, oh, you know, the problem we, you've got your search list inside of the main, the search list has to be outside the main. So we just take this here. It's trying to reload Professor Light. Yeah. Everybody is on Replit today. Well, I mean, that's the idea. Move the function outside the main. Yeah, it's National Replit Day. Everybody woke up and they said, I'm going to learn how to, how to program this. Well, yeah, mine's totally, let's try reloading it. Now it seems to be booting. Yeah, it, it's okay. We'll... Keep, keep playing with it and then we'll, we can come back to it. Okay. So here we have our nested for loops and the first for loop is going to go through all the numbers. So zero, one, two, three, on and on and on. And then from there, we have to find the smallest element from that point. So this is the key to making it all work. If the array at the current index is less than the min value, set that element to the min value. Set the index to the min index. Okay. And now we found the smallest item, put that into the min index and put the min value into where the start scan was. So the idea is you go through you keep finding the smallest item, put that into the position that you're on, the start scan. And then you keep moving on and you keep moving on and you keep moving on. And in the end, you have a sorted array. Because, because once you sort everything else, you don't care about the last element because it's been, it's been sorted. And you also have to go plus one inside of the... Yeah. Let's see. Well, the reason they go plus one is because of that minus one. So we, we have to start the scan from the position after, right? Because we're looking for the smallest element. And if you've already found the smallest element and put it into position zero, and then you're scanning from position zero, you're just going to keep finding the smallest, that same smallest one. That's why the start scan will continue. D did that make sense? That verbalizing you, you need to start looking. 
at the next element. Let's see, I just thought it was kind of weird because there's no index minus one. So, index minus one. Okay, so the index, this is where you start looking. The index is where you start looking for the smallest value at that point. Okay. So, by default, you say the min index is where you are. And the min value is whatever is in the first position. Or, you know, where you are in start scan. Look at start scan. Look at start scan. See, it starts at zero, and then that's going to be the smallest value. When you loop through all the rest of the numbers, if anything is smaller than that, you set that to be the smallest number. So the start scan is how you go through all the elements. Zero, one, two, three. And then the index is how you look from that point. Index looks from that point, but plus one. But does it make a little more sense after we spend some time with it? Okay. So in other words, it's just like adding one to it. It's 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 finding the smallest value and putting that in the first position. And now that's when start scan is zero. And then start scan goes to one and it finds the next smallest value. And it puts that in the one position. And then the next smart smallest value and on and on and on. And then once you've done everything but the last, it's already sorted. And then you can just return the sorted array. That makes a lot of sense. Good. Good. Okay. So the benefit, it is more efficient than bubble sort. There's fewer exchanges. And the disadvantage is it may not be as easy as bubble sort to understand. So. When I put easy at the beginning of this class, we're looking at easy algorithms. I, I did put it in quotation marks because it because doesn't mean somewhat not true. Yeah, because it doesn't mean that you're gonna get it instantly. I would say read the chapter. I would say type out the examples and spend some time with it. Spend some time with this topic because it, it is an important topic and it's a huge part of what people do with computers. They search and sort data. That's really, really important to just your career and getting ahead and just learning about an interesting topic. So, you know, you can try to motivate yourself with different things. It's interesting. It's good for your career, but it is important. There, it's, it's good that this chapter is in the book. It's good that in an introductory course, you're learning this because you're certainly capable of learning it. It's not like you need, you know, to get some special award and then you start learning it. So let's see, should we aim more towards binary search and selection sort uh, rather than the other alternatives? Seems like these two are more efficient. Well, I, I would say that if it kind of depends on like what your end and goals are. So um, the way that I usually treat this topic in this course is, you know, whether we're in person or online, I'm usually not going to ask you to recreate any of these from memory. So it's not like you have to have it on the tips of your fingers where you could do it, you know, instantly from just your memory. I think the more important thing is to be able to look at the code 
and apply it to a new problem. So one of the things that I've done in the past is give a problem with sorting weather data. So I just tell students, okay, look at the selection sort and use selection sort to sort the weather data. And it's, it's a challenging problem. Like students really have to think it through. Uh, obviously we're not gonna do that now because I just opened up the, the assignment on Memer, which has to do with, um, um, you know, the, the cipher, reading in the numbers, putting out the word. So I would say the main idea is being able to apply these. That's my goal. Students will be able to apply these algorithms to unique problems. All right, so maybe we'll do the weather problem after this one. Maybe not. We'll see. But the idea is that maybe there will be a new problem I find that's more interesting. But you can look at the code in the textbook. So you'll have the code open, and then you're applying it to a new problem. Not that you're 100% memorizing it. Now, as you move on in this field and you take more advanced courses, then you probably will be asked to just write these in a testing situation from memory, from scratch. And you'll probably have to do more advanced algorithms. So, yeah, that's, that's just what's coming in the future. For right now, this is the goal, to be able to look at the searching and sorting algorithms and then apply them by tweaking the code a little bit, by rewriting, changing things a little bit, to problems. So let's see. Got a little message here. Okay, that's funny. All right, good. So let's continue on. So I guess the point is it, it really wouldn't matter to me if I didn't specify in a problem which one you picked, as long as you got it sorted. Okay, so sorting and searching vectors. Sorting and searching algorithms can be applied to vectors as well as arrays. You need slight modifications to functions to use vector arguments. Okay, so you send in the vector. It's a good idea to pass it by reference because then you're not making a copy. You don't need to specify the vector size because you can use the size member function to calculate. Okay, and let's go ahead and take a look at that. Sorting a vector. Actually, let's just write it out. We got some time. Let's go to Replit. And we'll do a C++ Okay, and we'll call this sorting sorting a vector. Okay. Very good. So, should we have what what should our vector have what should our vector store somebody just give a suggestion what should our vector keep track of numbers okay that works so we go here and we add include vector. And then inside here, we're going to have a STD vector. I always mess up the syntax for vectors for some reason. And then it's going to be of integers. And then we'll call it, um, we'll just call it nums. That's fine. Okay. I didn't mess it up that time. That looks good. So now, why don't we just go ahead and have some random numbers added to our vector. So we can say, I wonder if there's a built-in way to do that. Let's look that up. Um, C++ add random numbers to vector. 
just sort of looking for a built-in, oh yeah, generate algorithm. Wow, yeah, this is pretty cool. So this is how I was going to do it, something like this. This is what I was going to do, but it looks like there's a way to do it. Okay, look, in modern C++, it's recommended not to use any time-based seeds, but to use random device to generate a seed. Oh, wow, look at this. This is really modern C++. Look at this. I, I would have done it a very old fashioned way. I mean, I think I'll probably still do it that way because it's easier for me to understand. But look at this. They say this, this is the best way to generate the random numbers because they say you should use random device to generate a seed. So this is the comment from Stack Overflow. So, yeah, that's really interesting. How old is this? Oh, modern six years ago. <laughs> but th this was the idea that I was going to do. And I, I just wanted to see if there was any, um, like, newer way of doing it. The only problem with this, like, newer way of doing it is it just looks so much more complicated that I, I don't think I'm going to do it that way. Um, but I wonder if there's like a built-in library to do this. Let's see. Let's keep looking for a bit more. Mm. I don't know. I don't think there's a built-in library for that. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just use something like this. Right. So we can we can look at this code right here. The idea is we've got our vector. We're going to have this random number generator and we're going to keep getting random numbers and just keep pushing them in. OK, so this this is the idea here. So let's let's go ahead and do this example. Um, so we're going to have S Rand. And we'll generate it with the current time. Let's see. It's 12.09. But there's, there's I, no, I appreciate that. But SRAND in C++. OK, we have to send in a seed value. And we can use, I guess you do put time null. OK. We can put time null in there. So let's go back here, put in time null. OK. And we might have to do some includes, like C standard library to make that work. But we'll, we'll find out. So now, how many random numbers should we put into this? Let's put in, I don't know, 100. So we'll say. Int i equals 0, well, i is less than 100, i plus plus. And now we're going to say nums.pushback. And for each one, we're going to add a random number. And for a random number, you'll see that we're going to have to have a certain size to it. So we'll, we'll say like between um, 50 and one will work. OK. And now let's see if this works. So let's loop through all of the numbers inside nums and print it out. OK, let's run it. And that looks pretty random. But now comes the tricky part, shorting it. Yes, now we're going to have to sort it. So at the beginning of this class, I was talking about how um, many people will just use sorting algorithms that others have written, right? And we're going to do the same right now. So Vector has some built-in sorting algorithms. 
And who remembers that Geeks for Geeks article about the vector sorting algorithm? What is the vector sorting algorithm based on? Does anybody remember? I mean, we've had a lot of material today, so I can imagine people are getting kind of kind of overwhelmed at this point. So, so basically, it was a combination of many sorting algorithms, and I think one was called um, quick sort. Seem to remember index sort, heap sort, heap sort was another one. Um, the point is that I was hoping people would remember all of them because I, I know I couldn't remember all of them, but <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's just a really, really set of complicated algorithms where each time you call sort, C++ is going to determine which is the optimal sort for that particular problem. So anyways, let's go ahead now and try to sort the... Let's try to sort this nums. So we can say nums dot and wait a minute. That's not it. No, I think it's like this. It's sort. Ah, God, now I'm forgetting the syntax. Okay, let's see. Vector C++ sort. When you forget the syntax, you just look it up. So here we go to C++ reference. And we see, oh, I was missing the STD, darn it. Okay, so we got to go back here. We got to say STD sort, and then we're going to send in nums. And still doesn't like that. Ah, I need, I need this. I needed two things. I'm forgetting all kinds of things. I needed to include this library. Okay, so I need to include algorithm for sort. And then it looks like I need to go from the beginning of the vector until the end of the vector. So we say here nums.begin and nums.end. Okay, now I think I have it. So what we're going to do is we're going to run after we sort it all the elements in the vector, okay? So after sorting, we are expecting the numbers from smallest to largest. Now let's look up here at this line, line 9. What's the range of numbers? 1 through 50. Very good. 1 through 50. So let's run it and see. Okay. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of 50, but only 1 of 49. 5 are 50. No, we don't need... No, no. No temp variable needed because what we're doing now is we are using the sorting algorithm from C++. So we're not implementing this sort. And truthfully, this is what most programmers do, right? Most programmers use sorting algorithms written by other people. Um, the expertise it would take to really write a good sorting algorithm is its a lot. Now, many of you are computer science majors. The computer science majors in here will spend a lot of time on this subject. And you will become fairly, ex you know, you'll become experts on this topic. 
And it's really, really important. Now we'll get into the money of the situation. Applying at the big institutions. So here we have FANG, this acronym. Does anyone know what companies are part of FANG? Okay, we've got Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. Yes, very good, Jose. Now, let's say that you're called into an interview, right? And they say, okay, pretend you have a million numbers. Write a sorting algorithm to sort them. You say, oh, all right, no problem. I'll write a sorting algorithm. And you go over to the board and you just write sort. And then you call the vector. Right? Yeah. Exit interview. You, you can't just say that. You can't just say, oh, I'll just call sort. Because at a lot of those companies, they work with so much data that they can't rely on the just pre-built algorithms. They need people who can actually work with the algorithms, develop new algorithms. Um, that's what they're really demanding. And part of it is just to see if you really paid attention in all your computer science courses. So with the knowledge from chapter eight, chapter eight is a foundation. It's not like we're saying, oh, you learn chapter eight and then you go to Google and you show them the bubble sort and, and they, they offer you the $200,000 job. No, that's, <laughs> that would be hilarious, right? But what you are doing is you're learning the basics of searching and sorting and it is important and that's how everybody did start. Right, So all the people who worked there at one point, they were learning bubble sort and they were learning selection sort and it went on and on and on and then they just kept learning. So yeah, it, but we did look at merge sort. We have looked at some of these algorithms. They're very complicated and it, it's a big, big study. So today is just like the introduction to this really cool field, this really interesting field and you know, frankly, one that requires a lot of focus and study. So I, I think that um, in a way, it's it. what I'm talking about is you sort of have to think about your own path. Like if you're an IT major, do you really have to know the, the intricacies of these different searching algorithms and sorting algorithms? No, no. <laughs> you don't need to worry about it as much. No, that's not a problem if you don't master it right now. Now you are focused on chapter eight. So if you read chapter eight and you type in the examples and you get the examples running and you, you have a good understanding for bubble sort, then you're in good shape. You're, you're on the right path. But I would say if you're a computer science student, then you would want to spend more time on it. So you can sort of think about yourself. You say, well, I'm an IT major. I want to be a systems administrator, I, I, I would agree with you. Then you don't need to have like this deep understanding of searching and sorting. But if you are computer science and you want to continue on in this field and get um, a job in this field, then it would be more important to spend time really focusing on this. So I think it's good that IT majors take this course. IT majors should take this course. And some of my colleagues have said, oh, they should, they should split up computer science students and IT students. No, it's required, but I'm just sort of like giving my opinion. I think that it's good. I think it's good to be required. Um, but, you know, like I have colleagues who say, oh, there should be computer science classes that are really small. And then it's more in depth and the IT students, they just get like super basics. But I don't know. I, I think that's like dividing things up too much because you never know in your career if you're going to want to do something different in the future. And then it sort of just keeps some doors open. Um, so that, that's another way to think about it. Like just learning more skills while you're young. Okay, so I think that's it. That's it for the slides. We went over the Memer assignment. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one other thing. 
Students yesterday in my Monday Wednesday class were were saying that they didn't know that there was a Code Wars assignment due. But I mean, the two places you're going to see assignments are Freer School and Memer. And also, we talk about them during this class. So some people don't attend this time slot, and they try to do everything just from looking at the sites. And I don't think it's as beneficial. It's as good. But if you didn't turn it in, turn it in today. And all you have to do is pick two problems and solve them and write up how you solve them. Let's see. Most of the eight level problems were too much for me. Some were super simple, though, and couldn't write a long enough report. Well, as long as they get to about 150 words, it's okay. All right, so then we have here, is the Chapter 5 quiz due today? Let's go look. Um, Professor, when was the code review assignment due? Um, it was due on Sunday, but if you turn it in today, that's okay. So just do turn it in today. I'll try and get it done today. Good, good. So let's see. Let's look at the Chapter 5 quiz, uh, 2 on looping. That is, yes, that's also due today. Now, here's, here's the thing about things about due dates. Okay. So part of the thing about due dates is right now I'm saying... All right, it was due on Sunday, just turn it in today. That's that's fine. That's not a huge deal. I'm not like a fanatic about due dates. But um, when I do get messages from people, can you open this up from a month ago? Can you open this up from this? No, 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 no. That there's That's impossible, right? Like I would be always with all these students opening things up, closing things, opening things up. We, the things that are over a week old are just done. So beyond a week are done. Now, I see some people are talking about some problems. We do have seven minutes. Why don't you paste the problem you had trouble with, and we could look at it now. 